Okay, I think we might get started here. Sasha, Let's what do you do think? Um, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so on behalf of the Town of Windsor and the Climate Adaptation Team, I would very much like to welcome you to this first of several workshops on our Climate Adaptation Project. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking a little time out of your evening, especially with March Madness going on right now, for a while to participate in this uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Carl Ufrat. I'm a civil engineer with the town's public works department and a project manager. Uh, in addition to me, there are additional town departments involved in this project and town staff who were instrumental in participating and managing this project. And in addition to town staff, there's also our consultants team, which is experienced in climate adaptation and has put this project together. Uh, I'd like to provide all with just a very brief um, history on this project. Uh, this is a grant funded project administered through Caltrans. Uh, the grant was advertised in late 2018. The town applied for a grant in November of 2018. On May 17, 2019, the town was informed that the grant was being awarded for this project. A request for proposals, an RFP, was issued to interested firms in March of 2020. And we said the proposals were going to be due on March 24th, 2020 which is one week after COVID hit and the world kind of shut down. So we also, this project became virtual for us pretty much that week. And we extended the deadline for proposals to early April of 2020. Uh, a total of four proposals were received and we scheduled interviews with all four teams. And in early May, we chose Adaptation International as the lead consultant for the project and the town council awarded the project on June 3rd, 2020. Uh, representing uh, Adaptation International mm -hmm. is the founding member, Sasha Peterson. Uh, Sasha has assembled a core consultant team, which includes Blue Point Planning and its representative, Mindy Craig. And you'll be hearing from both of them and a few others during this mm -hmm. workshop. Uh, so therefore, at this time, I would like to turn the workshop over to them. And again, thank you for your time to participate this evening, and hopefully we can answer a few questions, any questions you might have along the way and in the months to come. So Sasha. Right. Or... I'll, I'll take it over, uh, Carl, thank you. And if you mind moving on to the next slide, Sasha. So I'm sure many of you have been on Zoom right now, but uh, just wanna give you a quick overview. Just make sure to keep yourself on mute because I know the dogs and the UPS guys are at future are a constant uh, battle. Um, looks like Sasha, we went back, there we go. Um, we're using chat as one of the number one things that uh, you can communicate. You know, usually you're not supposed to pass notes when other people are talking. We encourage it here. Ask questions, especially if there's something clarifying. We have two people, Yami and Nisa, who are on our team who will be um, monitoring that and helping to figure that out. We're going to use something called breakout rooms, and you'll see that in just a second. Um, that will, will take you and allow you to talk to one another in a little smaller group. Um, we are going to record this meeting, um, and we are going to save this recording and provide it on the website with closed captions in Spanish. Um, and we're also going to use one other tool called Mentimeter, um, which is just a polling tool, which is kind of cool to allow you guys to give us some comments in a pretty organized way. Um, so that'll be uh, really fun. So let's go on to the next slide, Sasha. All right. So for our first thing, we're gonna go into a breakout group. And this is really just a chance to get a little uh, closer to know some know who's in the room, so to speak, um, and to talk to some folks. So um, I am going to assign you to those and you're gonna pop up in another room. There's about five or six of you in each of those rooms. And just introduce yourself, um, tell us the neighborhood you live in and one thing you love about Windsor. You should also be able to chance to meet some of the town uh, team. So without further ado, I'm going to give you about five minutes to do that. Um, so with further ado, I'm going to send you off and you're going to see a little screen that comes up on your thing that's going to invite you into that room. Go ahead and click on that. Uh, and I'll stay here and make sure everybody can uh, to get, get there. All right, here we go. So you should all see on your screen a little invitation to go to a breakout room. So head on over. Hey, Stephanie, um, I just signed you, oh, there you go. I just assigned you to a breakout room. 
uh, you might see something on your screen, go ahead and uh, click on that to join. Do you see that? There you go. And Mona, I sent you to one too. Do you see a, something on your screen that says join? Which room did you send me to? Um, you know, I don't see you. So why don't you can also just click because I, I think you're the host. So if you I'm going to join room five because they okay. don't have as many people. Great. Five. Bye. Bye. I can't assign you because you're a host. I think that's the deal. But you should be able to click on it and go. Are you? Aria? I don't hear you, but um, are, were you able to get in? Hi, Nathan. Uh, Hi. Thanks for jo just joining us. We're in break rooms right now. So I'm going to have you go and <laughs> okay. uh, join uh, a group and just introduce yourself and tell us the, what, tell them what you love about uh, Windsor. So hold on one second and I'll send you over. Okay. Here you go. Hi, Danica. Um, we just got, we're all in um, some breakout rooms introducing ourselves. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna send you over to a room and you can say hi to everybody in that room. It just, we have just a minute more, but hold on tight. It should be uh, something on your screen that says, uh, there you go, perfect. Hey, Cindy, um, we're just doing some introductions. So I'm going to send you over to a room so you can say hi to folks. We're just about finished up, but you'll have just a second.
Welcome back, folks. And if you're while you're waiting here, you can always type into the chat some of the things you love about Windsor or what you heard from somebody else that they loved. We're almost all back. I think everybody has a little bit of it's a couple more seconds left. Don't be shy. Somebody must have heard something they liked about Windsor. Come on, Kim, you can type it in. <laughs> I can't hear you. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, hopefully you found something nice about your neighbor and your friends and our consultant and town team. So if you want, ah, that's, if you want to spend any moment, uh, say something about you love, uh, in the chat, we'd love to hear it. We're not going to talk about it, but it's great to see. Like, there's a couple one about community spirit is honor to live, work, and play in this town. So, we'd love to see what else you guys learned as you started that. All right. So, I now want to turn it back to Sasha, our to Sasha for the first time, and he is going to give us a project overview. Sasha. Awesome. Thank you, Mindy. And thanks for that breakout. It was cool to have a little moment to get to connect with some of the people in the workshop. You know, it's not the same as being there in person, but we'll try to do our best with this electronic medium. Um, my name is Sasha Peterson. I'm the director of Adaptation International. As Carl mentioned, we're the lead project partner for this project with the town. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to work with you over the course of this project. And I'm really excited to see so many people on the call and we really want to keep this an open dialogue and forum like it would have been if it was a real workshop so feel free to type notes into the chat we're going to have polls we're going to have some breakout and then we're going to have discussion areas as we go through um, before we dive into that i'm just going to give a little bit more of an overview and orientation to the project as a whole building on what carl said um, as well as this evening so that orientation and introduction. We'll be wrapping up that first section there for the agenda. Then we're going to spend some time talking about what does it mean for you, for the town of Windsor, to be resilient. Then a core of the discussion will be around the climate challenges for the community. We know wildfire is definitely a near and present concern. And in my breakout session, we talked about you know how close it came and some of the actions that are already being taken to enhance resilience around that. So I'm going to provide a little bit of overview on some of the big picture climate challenges for the town. And then we're going to do pick two of them and kind of do a little bit more of a focus deep dive on wildfire risks and then transportation and evacuation, although there are other issues that will be part of this project. Then we'll come back to, and have a discussion on resilience values and goals from your perspective, and then just a little time to wrap up and we'll get you out of here by 730. So you can have dinner and be with your friends and family. Um, here's a, just a quick slide on the project team. So in addition to our team at Adaptation International in the top right and Mindy's group with Blue Plain Planning at the bottom right, we have Nelson Nygaard in the top left and they're the transportation lead for the project. And then Bullock and Haddow on the bottom left are the disaster preparedness and evacuation lead. And you'll be hearing from both of those them in that focus area discussion. Before we dive into this project itself, there's a lot of ways to respond to this really significant issue of climate change. And they really fall into two big categories. And in the field, they talk about it as mitigation and adaptation. And those are shown in these two big circles here. So the circle on the left, the blue circle, actions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions or reduce greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change and limit the long-term impacts of climate change are things that the town is already started on. And many of you are probably doing, you know, investing in renewable energy, maybe looking at installing electric vehicle charging stations, being more energy efficient. Those actions reduce the long-term impacts of climate change. The other side of responding to climate change is on the adaptation piece. And that's preparing for the impacts of climate change that are already here or are going to happen in the future. So it's managing the risks of climate change. And that's really where this project is centered. The Windsor Resilience Plan will look at actions like enhancing transportation network planning, reducing wildfire risk, 
coordinating with regional evacuation planning and other areas to enhance the resilience of the community. Of course, there are some things that are in that overlap, like that do both. If you plant trees, they absorb carbon dioxide, which is one of a key greenhouse gas, but they also create shade and absorb stormwater. So they fall into both categories and those will of course also be considered, but the primary focus will be on the adaptation part of the circle. We also see this project and the opportunity to have the Caltrans Adaptation Planning Grant as an opportunity for the town to continue to invest in engagement, like having these discussions and others throughout the course of the project. Uh, it's also an opportunity to improve preparedness for those extreme weather events that have happened and will continue to happen. But beyond preparing for a single extreme event, it's an opportunity to invest in the community. So to improve the quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis, but then also accentuate you know, the ability to be prepared for those extreme weather events. The planning process itself is for the big picture adaptation planning process, the state of California divides it into these four big phases. And you can see down in the blue there, outreach and engagement is critical across all those phases. So we're glad to have you here to help guide the process. Um, the first phase is to define, explore, and really refine the goals of the project. Second phase is assessing the vulnerabilities. Uh, what are the key climate hazards and exposures affecting the community or ones that will affect the community? Phase three is defining your adaptation framework, developing the strategies, and then phase four is actually implementing and then monitoring, adjusting those actions over time. This project won't get all the way through all four of those phases. The implementation piece is really, will be after the end of this project, but the goal is to get through those first three phases over the course of this project. So what is the Windsor Resilience Plan? This plan really is a holistic community resilience plan. It's not designed to be a replacement for an existing emergency preparedness plans or hazard mitigation efforts, though what comes out of this planning process can help inform developments or updates to those other plans. This plan will create a roadmap for action. So sort of lay out the key challenges that you know are already there, but may continue to get worse with climate change. It's not gonna be specific policies or regulations. Those would come after this foundation is built. It will also, the Windsor Resilience Plan will also be a toolbox of actions that the town and the community can consider together for implementation. You know, ones that are right-sized or customized for the town and address the concerns that you have, but passing or adopting the plan, you know, sort of solidifies those tools, but it doesn't make commitments to implement any individual action that would be referenced in the plan. All right, and finally, the last piece of the overview is what is the timeline for the project? It's really the rest of this calendar year. There'll be a little bit of finalization and work done in early 2022, but the core of the work for the project is done over the course of 2021. You can see we're here at the end of March with this first engagement circle here doing this workshop. We're also in the background working with the town to complete the vulnerability assessment. And from this engagement and other surveys and things that are out there that we'll talk about, we wanna really kind of clarify the community visions and goals for resilience. Then there'll be more and at least two other workshops where community members can weigh in on what are the actions that be, should, that should be considered, how can those actions be customized, and what are the community priorities for implementing those actions. That will happen over the course of the summer and early fall. And then in the late fall, we'll be drafting the resilience plan. It'll be provided for comment and input and refinement, and the final plan will come out at the end of the year. So if there have, if you have questions or comments you know, about this overall, Thing, please type them into the chat and we'll jump into it. Um, otherwise, we can move on, Mindy, to the discussion of the resilience, yeah. you know, the ideas of resilience. Great. Do you want to just switch over this, the slide just for fun? So, you know, just heard a lot on our, what we've talked about with resilience, but what we've recognized is that what resilience means is very different from a community to community. And so right now at the beginning of this project, we want to ground this in your, your vision of what resilience is. And so we will share the kind of the technical, uh, what, what sort of the, the, 
the big heads at, at, at different elements have said is resilience, but really what matters ultimately is what you say is resilience. So we're going to start with a little exercise um, with a pro it's something called Mentimeter. Um, and it is an online uh, polling system that's a little bit more fun than if you've seen it on uh, um, the mural or on this. And Yami has just posted the link to the uh, Mentimeter in the chat. And I'm going to switch our screen over to that. And so what I want to ask is have you put in a word or two, what do you think it means for the town of Windsor to be resilient? Um, you know, no, no wrong answers, no right answers. It's just what is your opinion of what that might mean. And so you should have a couple of different ways you can enter. If you've gone into that, click on that link, you should automatically come up with a screen. There we go. Um, there's a couple of ways you can get to that. So Mindy, just to clarify, click on the link in the chat. Yes, in the chat, exactly. And it'll bring up a different, like it'll bring up your browser and then there'll be a question in there that you can just answer. Exactly, yeah. So okay. if you and if you can't, uh, if you're having any problems, let's just chat that in there and we can help you to actually add your words into it. And we can also just, we'll see that as well. There we go. bounce back, survivability, recover quickly, ready for drought. It might rain next week, we can only hope, but that's not gonna save the drought, is it? Cohabitation, communication, these are great. I think you have a couple opportunities prepared, ready. Safer from fires, nimble response, retaining character, yeah. right? These are great. If you see a word in there that you want to echo, you know, that really speaks to you, feel free to type it in again. Adaptable, efficient evacuation. Flexibility, proactive, food for all, safer from fires. These are awesome. All right, it looks like we're, we're about there. So I think one of the things, and I'd love if anybody wanted to add to this is they're, they're thinking about what this might mean to them. Uh, obviously one word can't necessarily encompass all the things that are what resilience means. So does anybody else wanna sort of add to this mix and just say, and I can't see all of you unfortunately. So I'm gonna say, you can just go ahead and uh, speak up immediately. Um, Torben, it looks like you're talking, but I can't, you're on mute. If I find the right button, your button there doesn't you are. help. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't seem to be unable to find a, um, a way to enter anything. Am I doing something wrong? Uh, do you see in the, in the chat, do you see at the bottom of your screen, you should say little things that says chat. Okay, but I don't. And there but, should be a little link there that is, is kind of its weird language, but it says menti.com and has kind of a weird uh, element. It's from no, Yami. Not, not on the chat. I see the, I see the screen mm. and I can certainly add my, uh, um, uh, which I just did. Mindy, I, th I think you might have to scroll up in that screen to see the link. It I just sent it. I just sent oh, the link go. again. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And I, I have the I have the link. I'm on I'm on the list. And what I basically wanted to say, which I didn't see yet, but I may not have read through it, I think resiliency is also minimizing loss both in people mm -hmm. and property. That's right. that's my uh, magnum opus for that word. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know some of the things in, in this this together can start to tell a story. And again, it's not one thing. It's all these things and. Uh, that idea of bouncing back and being prepared is, is kind of the combination, right? So it's that minimizing of our losses by being well prepared and then also being even more prepared to bounce back and sometimes even say to be even better. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunities here in seeing some of that, um, which I really appreciate. And it does great. Um, Sasha, do you have any other things to add to this? Um, no, I, this is a great list. It's nice to see some of those positive attributes also accentuated, you know, like growth and spirit. Um, 
So it's both, like you said, you know, being prepared and reducing risk, but also bouncing forward even, you know, so that you are prepared for what's going to happen. And yeah, yeah, proactive. That, com cares. Yeah. that committed to community also sticks out to me too. And that that that's a that's something that I've heard thriving and strong. Those are those are very positive words. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this and we'll keep all these things. They'll become part of our the basis of this conversation and you'll get reflected back some of these goals and ideas as, as we get uh, further along in the process. Um, all right, Sasha, I'll leave it back to you. All right, awesome. Um, I don't think we I had a slide in case the group was silent on what they yeah. thought resilience was. And these definitions are from the National Climate Assessment or from the Kresge Foundation's report on urban resilience, but they really just cover a lot of the things that were said well by the workshop group, you know, the ability to prepare, respond to and recover from different threats and hazards, but then also in the Kresge definition, the opportunity to, like the ability to seize opportunities associated with change. So I saw a lot of that reflected in the word clouds that people put in. Um, and some of these other characteristics of a resilient system we saw in that list, you know, flexible, resourceful, redundant. Um, you know, one of the things that's come up is the ability to learn from past experience, so being reflective. And, you know, I know the town is, is already doing that based on the wildfires in the last couple seasons. Um, maybe just one more quick pause before we jump into the climate challenges for the community. Um, see if anybody other has a burning thing that they didn't get to type in, you know, wants to chat or raise their hand or add to that initial idea of resilience. If, uh, if I may, um, I've always been learning in class that it's, um, not just about being able to bounce back and what we can do to prepare, but also being able to cohabitate with the environment around us, working with the natural landscape and the natural environment to um, basically marry a, a lifestyle that is beneficial for the both of us, you know, for the environment and for the people who live in it. So just keeping in mind, uh, you know, working with the environment rather than against it for the resilience of everyone. Yeah, that's great. And actually, if you had typed in that cohabitation, that really helps clarify what is meant behind that idea. So appreciate that. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can't see. Yep. I can't seem to find where to raise my hand. Um, I, I think one of the things that was mentioned, but it's really needs to be repeated is the communication. Um, you know, as we're going, getting ready for an event that may or may not come as we're going through an event that's happening. And then as we're following up with the event it is the communication is that that feeling of community and that everybody is aware and advised and everybody has, even if it's not a singular vision, at least they have a view of, of the same, the same goal, the same, the same view of it, that at least everybody is communicating and has um, uh, some attention to, to everyone else in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a collective shared vision, but also a collective sort of responsibility and that you're looking out for each other and communicating about that during those hard situations. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you. And feel free to, you know, as you mull these over, keep adding things to the chat and we can, you know, we'll capture that and make sure that gets integrated or we can come back and talk about it as we go through. Um, I'm going to provide a short overview of, you know, some of the overarching climate challenges before those two focus area discussions. Um, as you have thoughts, questions, comments, feel free to type them in and then we'll have another pause for some polls and discussion as, as we get to the end of this first little section. Um, so what are the key climate exposures that are affecting the community? These are things that you all know, but it's just maybe worth seeing and having highlighted. So extreme temperatures, you know, summertime temperatures are 
drive a lot of changes in the environment, as do changes in precipitation. So whether it's extreme precipitation, too much or too little, that can definitely impact our community. So how does it impact the community through, you know, some of these key climate hazards that are facing the town of Windsor? So extreme heat, you know, as the climate changes, it, hot days were likely to get hotter and heat waves potentially longer. It can also, extreme temperatures can increase the risk of wildfires or lengthen droughts, make them more intense. Similarly, changes in precipitation, if there's not enough precipitation, it can create drought related environments or if there's too much precipitation, it can create flooding. And then it's also great to acknowledge that there are non-climate stressors that affect the community. So whether it's earthquakes or obviously pandemics from this year or changes in demographics, socioeconomic information, you know, socioeconomics or the economy, those can all affect the community. And it can affect all of us and the town that you live in. So it can affect people, the health and safety of individuals, it can affect homes and buildings, it can affect infrastructure, you know, trans the transportation network, utilities, critical facilities like schools and police stations, hospitals. It can affect the economy both through tourism or the, you know, the jobs that are based there in the town. So the real challenge is not so much that the climate itself is changing, it's that we as humans have based our development of towns and jobs and agriculture and everything around this idea that the climate is stable. So let's take this graphic from my colleague, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, and she likes to explain it. This graph could be anything. It could be temperatures, it could be precipitation. You know, there's highs and lows. If it was daily temperature, you can see there are hot days and cooler days over time. It could be annual average precipitation and there are wet years and dry years. And we've designed our systems around this expectation of the historical extremes. Like, yes, we're prepared to deal with a hundred year flood or we're prepared to deal with temperatures that are hundred or 105 degrees. But what happens if that assumption of stationarity that the climate over the long term isn't changing, even though there's variability is wrong and that the climate is changing. And now what we've designed our systems around in the future, the extremes are going to be beyond those limits. So the floods will be greater than what we've prepared for, or the temperature is hotter than what we've prepared for. So this project gives us the opportunity to dive into that and look at ways that the town of Windsor can be better prepared for that future climate conditions. Mindy, did you want to break yeah, here? We can, okay. or we can hold if you want to go through the rest of these. It's up to I, you. I don't know. It might be nice to get a little snapshot okay. of people's thinking on those concerns. Great. So, uh, Yami, do you want to repost that? If you were already in the Mentimeter, you should be able to stay and do the. I've gone to the next slide. Um, and now, so the question here is what are the biggest climate related challenges facing the town of Windsor? So if you click again on the uh, Mentimeter thing, you should all of a sudden see this option and you can click on ones that apply. You can click on more than one um, and you should be able to choose what you think are the biggest issues that are facing the town of Windsor. Um, are people seeing that? Okay, I see a couple of people getting in there. There we go. Wildfires and drought are currently in the lead. This is like when you go to the baseball game and you see the dot races. What will win here? And if you're having trouble at all with the Mentimeter, feel free to type it in the, type it in the chat and one of us can enter yeah. it for you. I remember the good days when we had heavy rainfall. We haven't had that for a while. It seems that's pretty much out of our uh, mindset at this point. Although I, talking to folks in the town around, uh, especially some of the people who are in the water systems, they, they can, they're concerned about that. But really, it seems like what we're looking at is a pretty clear tie of wildfire drought with smoke from the wildfires coming right behind it. And then extreme heat is, is right there. I think anybody who was here last summer kind of saw the three of those things, all or four of those things happening in, in yeah, together at one time. They don't happen in isolation, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's that's actually an important thing in Sasha's last little chart with the 
gone beyond with our systems is how do we prepare for all these things happening at one time and really intensely. Um, I have one more, I think, is uh, we're going to go to, sorry, I have multiple things on my screen here trying to get to. Uh, this is actually not yet. So we're going to stick with this one. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it back uh, to Sasha. Thanks, Sasha. Yeah. Sorry, I have to lost my screen share button for a second too. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's definitely in line. Those concerns are what the county has also identified. You know, this top group of hotter, drier weather with longer summers are things that they have already identified as, you know, key climate concerns facing the county, more extreme hot days, potential for frequent and intense droughts, obviously wildfires, and fewer nights that uh, freeze, and that can be important for agriculture. And then also more variable rain that did pop up there, but just slightly. So what about for the town itself? Let's look back at observed temperatures. This is a graph of observed temperature data from the Santa Rosa weather station. You can see on the bottom here, if I, my 40 year old plus eyes can actually make it out, it goes back over two years. So the normal range for temperatures annually is shown in that green shaded area. It goes up and down. Summer temperatures are of course warmer than winter temperatures. All those little blue lines are the actual observed temperatures from those days over the course of the last two years. And you can see obviously in the summer, there were days both years up at 105 degrees and last year even above 110. And then in, over the winter, there were days below freezing. So what if we zoom out a little? These data are from CalAdapt and that tool. And it actually looks again at Sonoma County as a whole, but it looks backwards. So from about 2010 back to the 1950s, and that's the observed annual average temperature for the county. Um, and you can see there's actually a pretty distinct trend of increasing temperatures over the last 50 plus years. The California for Fourth Climate Assessment Report said that for the Bay Area, area average, in, which includes Sonoma County, average annual maximum temperatures increased 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 50 years. It doesn't sound like very much, but it does influence those extreme events that may go beyond our system parameters. So climate scientists look to the future. You can model the climate of the future with computer models. And they use these scenarios because they don't know exactly what the future is going to hold. They don't know how we as a society are going to respond to climate change and other factors. So they make some educated guesses and develop a range of scenarios. If you look at more the business as usual or higher end of those scenarios that they look at, these are the temperature projections going out through the end of the century. And you can see that by the middle of the century, by the 2050s, there's another almost four degrees of warming for the county. And by the end of the century, there's almost eight, and there's about seven degrees of warming. So that's something that the town will need to be thinking about and preparing for as we make future investments. Now let's look back at precipitation, similar Similar graphic, again, from Santa Rosa Weather Station. This time we've zoomed out, so it's actually going back 10 years. So you can see January of 2011 and that first graph. These curves here are the annual water accumulation, so how much rain you get over the course of the year. And you can see that there are wetter years and drier years, particularly if you look at 2019, there was a lot more than average rainfall. And then it may seem like a distant memory because of 2020 and how much less rainfall the county received or that weather station received that year. And we all know the subsequent impacts of that in terms of exacerbating the wildfire season. So again, similar graphic, let's expand that, go back in time using CalAdapt. This is the observed precipitation annual average precipitation for the county. And you can see a lot of variability. It's hard for me to make out if there's a real trend, but there's definitely those wet years and those dry years. And the California Fourth Assessment Appoint Report says that you know in the Bay Area, high year to year variability, these boom and bust cycles with very wet years and very dry years is likely to continue. So if we zoom out 
into the future for the rest of the century, you can see there is potentially those dark lines in the middle of the shaded areas are the averages of the different models. And you can see there is the potentially a slight increase in overall precipitation, about 8% increase by the middle of the century and a little more than 12 percent increase by the 2080s. But then you can also see that big variability. And so it's not all going to be a nice smooth curve. There'll be wet years, there'll still be dry years. In fact, there may be longer, more heavy precipitation events and then longer periods between precipitation events. And even if precipitation was gonna stay the same, the hotter temperatures mean there'll be more evaporation and evapotranspiration and things will get drier during the summer period. So these impacts, of course, affect us as humans, and there are a variety of ways and that it makes those impacts. You know, there could be extreme heat events, severe weather events, changes in air pollution like the smoke from the wildfires, potential changes in vector-borne diseases or increases in allergens or water quality impacts. This, um, so we just have to keep those in mind that it's not, you know, it's not about necessarily the change in precipitation about the impacts on us and then the environment and our infrastructure. But not everyone is going to be affected equally. You know, some members of the community are going to be more potentially more vulnerable to these changes due to a variety of factors. So people that are more sensitive during extreme weather and climate related events depend on a, some neighborhood characteristics, but they also depend on individual characteristics. So age-related sensitivities um, due to physiology, older adults and young children can be more susceptible to things like smoke and extreme heat. Um, residents with physical or mental disabilities may be unable to prepare or respond effectively to some of those extreme weather conditions. Also, residents with pre-existing conditions may be predisposed to be more sensitive to these climate and weather-related stressors. So someone with asthma may be more sensitive to the smoke from wildfires. Then at a broader scale, both you know, individuals and families, but sometimes groups and neighborhoods, you know, economic capacity. So socioeconomic status, if you're living in poverty, it can be harder to prepare for or respond to extreme weather events. Um, we also have to acknowledge the systematic oppression or exclusion that's happened like historically, but also in being involved in these adaptation preparation and response and recovery. There's been studies that affluent white communities receive more funding post-disaster than black and brown low-income neighborhoods. Um, Livelihood-based factors, so depending on where you work, you may be more affected by these extreme weather events, access to technology, access to vehicles, housing type, these all can impact who is affected. So we wanna look at that with the town over the course of this project. And there are a lot of ways to look at the data and kind of help you know, determine where to focus efforts or what segments of the community may be more affected. One way is through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Social Vulnerability Index. You can see these categories over here. The overall vulnerability is defined by a grouping of different areas. You know, the socioeconomic status can affect it, household composition or disability, looking at minority status and language status can affect the vulnerability as well as housing type, transportation availability and infrastructure. So if we were to play that out using census and community data for the town of Windsor, you can see you know, these blocks here are the census tracks for the town. And so just to give you a feel of it, this you know, Windsor 101 corridor and then the southwest portion of Windsor have characteristics that make some of those residents potentially more vulnerable to these extreme weather events where the northeast suburbs and that area, those the people who live there have characteristics that tend to make them less vulnerable. Um, the color coding here in those numbers, the 60 in those different sections or the 22 or the 11, those are relative to all census tracts in California. So the 101 quarter is in the 60th percentile of vulnerability based on all those factors for California as a whole. Um, I see Trevor's adding in some comments to the chat, which is great. He's on our team and 
saying that this is an opportunity to paint a picture of some of the characteristics that might influence vulnerability. It's also an opportunity to determine where to implement actions to enhance resilience. So with that, Mindy, was there another poll? And then can we pause and open it up for no, questions? No, we, we were going to move right on to wildfire. I think that was our, our move. OK. Yeah, there, there's some questions, but they're going to come at the end of, of yeah. what I'm going to be talking about. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Damon Coppola. I'm a hazard risk management specialist on the team. And I'm going to be talking for just a little bit about how wildfires are changing and what that might mean for Windsor. Uh, I think it's telling that in the survey that was conducted just a few minutes ago, wildfires got the most vote at 14, uh, because in the past, and including in the current hazard mitigation plan, floods were the highest ranked risk, which shows that there's, there's at least a change in perception in the town. Um, a big part of what I do is assess hazards from a mathematical standpoint, like where fires might start or, or how they'll behave if they do. But what we're really concerned about from a resilience perspective is what wildfire risk or, or any risk means for the people who are exposed. And so I'm gonna talk about wildfires. What's most important tonight is that we hear from you all uh, as residents um, about how you see the wildfire threat affecting you and, and also how you might have already been impacted by it. So next slide. And so on this slide, um, at the national level, um, we see that there's been an ongoing shift in wildfire activity, which also matches what we've seen in California. And that's something that gives us a sense of urgency as we try to understand what's going on so that we can deal with it from a local perspective. What we do know is that the factors that make wildfires happen uh, are happening more often. And it's not just one of the many conditions, there's several of them. Um, and this map shows, uh, these, these three maps show the progression of how those conditions are changing and how they've changed over the past 80 years. And in several of these places, uh, including where Windsor's located, these conditions have become as much as 10 times more likely than in the 1940s. So these are major changes. And from a planning standpoint, we have to assume that at least the precursors for wildfire are much more common than they had been. And also that they'll probably be getting more common in the future than they are now if we don't address what's causing these changes. And so in the next slide, uh, we see a map of uh, how wildfire risk has been assessed for Windsor. And this is something that hasn't changed much since 2007. Uh, next map, yep, that one. Um, and anytime we map a hazard like this, um, and this is true with all risk management, we, we have to remind ourselves that it's really just the best possible estimate that we can give, and it's made using the best information we have. So for this map on the left, which shows that Windsor has no significant wildfire risk, it's, this isn't some kind of crystal ball, it's just for a long time, something that's proven to be pretty accurate for what's happened. And unfortunately, events like the Kincaid fire and the, the fires that happened late last year uh, are a reminder that conditions do change. And when they do change, so do all of our risk assessments. And so with that in mind, um, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide. I was gonna do a poll here, but we're gonna put them all at the end. Um, this is a slide that, that shows the, the changing behavior of wildfires um, as a diagram. Um, there's this relatively new phenomenon you probably heard of uh, because it's, it's referred to in the media quite a bit when it does happen, it's firestorm. Um, and firestorms are different from wildfires because they're so big and they're so hot and they create their own weather systems and, and, and they defy logic um, in that they seem to act totally different from what we would expect a wildfire to do. And so with this happening, everything from our evacuation plans, our building codes, our regulations on, on development, they're all based on what we thought fires would do. And they're acting differently than we thought that they would. Um, this, as you know, this diagram shows, these firestorms are producing tornadoes and they're causing lightning strikes, which cause more fires. And um, where fires were pretty predictable because they follow the seasonal winds, now they make their own weather and they 
just go pretty much wherever they want. And uh, that brings us to the next slide, uh, which is, uh, I'm sure something most of you have seen, which is uh, Coffee Park about three months after the Tubbs fire. And uh, this was a totally unexpected event. Um, and the fact that it happened like it did change what was considered to even be possible in terms of where fires might burn or what might happen once they started. So we've looked at this event to try to understand what does that mean for Windsor's risk? Because now we have to be sure we aren't just planning for wildfire, but that we're planning for the right kind of wildfire. And Coffee Park wasn't in any high risk wildfire zone, which is a lot like just about all of Windsor. So we have to know if this was some kind of fluke or bad assessment for a coffee park. Um, but the past doesn't really help us if the hazard is changing. We have to look to other factors to, uh, to let us know what's going on. And that's uh, the next slide. All right, so this slide shows us how when we look at different factors, other than the wildland urban interface, which is how we traditionally assess the risk, the, the picture of wildfire risk starts to change a little. And so where before risk was mostly a matter of location, now we also have to consider situations where fire has been transported to any place in town by, by ember cast, by lightning, um, and by these fire storms. Because once it's there, these other factors tell us whether it's going to cause a new fire if it happens and whether that fire will stay lit and whether the nearby structures are going to make the fire, this new fire worse and so on. Uh, so last slide. So finally, we have to consider the other aspects of fires, which are the indirect impacts. Um, and because these indirect impacts have an impact on, on our resilience. Uh, earlier on in that, in that uh, Mentimeter, we talked about what resilience means. And, and there's a lot of agreement that resilience is a lot more about um, it's, it's about a lot more things than protecting homes or property or even people. It's also about protecting the way of life in town. Uh, so how do these other hazards affect life in Windsor, including if a fire never happens in Windsor? We saw last year that uh, some places in California had more than 100 days uh, where there was wildfire smoke from somewhere else. And that had a huge effect on not even, not just the physical, health of the people who were there, but also their mental health. And it's not just the smoke, it's, it's also the worry about whether housing values can be protected, you know, especially if we see that insurance companies are pulling out of some high risk areas because of fires. And how much the town's image is affected by wildfires throughout the rest of California, um, so that visitors might feel a little worried about planning a visit or, or companies being less inclined to invest. These, these are all questions that feeds into what resilience means for the town and how being able to be a strong community is important, even if the town is never actually directly impacted by a fire. And, uh, and so with that, there's uh, two Mentimeter questions that, that I think will help us to answer some of these, these questions for the community. Great, thanks Damon. And uh, so I've taken over the screen again. And if folks uh, want to click again on that menu, you might still already have it open in your browser. Um, this question is, I believe that wildfires are a threat to choose all of that apply. The town of Windsor, my home, our way of life, the economy, our health. We could probably keep on going, but uh, we, we're trying to keep it limited here. Uh, and and uh, Damon, feel free to jump in here as things are jumping up. It's interesting seeing the bars dance mm -hmm. as they are coming to us. It seems like the town and our health are neck and neck at this point. And uh, I think one thing, you know, I'd like, you know, for, for any, any project like this, um, you know, we, we tend to focus so much on hazards as a, as a specific impact. And, and, you know, I just like people to think about do wildfires have to actually hit the town 
directly for there to be impacts to the way of life that people expect or, or to the economy or people's health. So, you know, what kind of things can happen if, uh, if there never actually is a fire in town, but wildfire risk is still something that uh, is, a, is a threat to them. Exactly. Um, well, here, let me go to the next one. Um, and then this is sort of an open-ended question. We're gonna only give one choice this time, which is wildfire risk in Windsor is decreasing, staying the same or increasing. <laughs> I guess I'm seeing a trend here. <laughs> like, a, like a heartbeat the way that hundred. <laughs> Maybe, is that happening anytime someone puts in their answer? Yeah, yeah, I can see that 12 oh, there people. You go. We, there we got go. one difference. Okay. Yeah, I can I can see 12 people have voted so far. So uh, we're getting there. But I have a feeling that uh, the increasing is going to be the winner of this race. I mean, I, I think uh, as you know, as I mentioned before, wildfire risk was from a statistical standpoint, and this is in the, the mitigation plan, the county mitigation plan, um, wildfire risk was was traditionally lower than uh, flood risk simply because the assessment uh, of exposure showed mm. the downtown area to be generally safe. So I'm wondering how how much wildfire risk has changed, uh, how residents look at other risks uh, now that the past couple of years have uh, changed that viewpoint. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, we have a moment now. I, I just thought we could see each other somewhat. And, and yeah. if anybody has any thoughts or wants to add to some of Damon's uh, ideas about what, what they are thinking, I know this is the, the very big topic for folks. So um, I, I can see some of you. Um, so if you unmute yourself, and then you can start if you want to add a comment. Or, of course, please add it into the chat uh, because that's very useful. We can see that and we'll capture that. Anybody want to add to the, the mix here? Or did we say everything? It's increasing. <laughs> and no, it's I think in, the, in that first Mentimeter, you're, you're right that it's, uh, we, we listed five things, but you know, I wonder what, what else about the, the way of life in Windsor has anybody um, felt any impact, whether it, it be personally or something that, that affects the community um, as a result of, of the, the evacuation that took place and then the, the fires that happened last year that threatened the town but never actually impacted it directly. What, what about the life in town is changing? I'd say there's a, re a related um, problem with just the PSPS and people having power for emergencies and mm -hmm. people who are at risk not being mm -hmm. able to uh, access medical equipment. I mean, it's just a whole range of um, secondary effects from the wildfire that I don't know that we're prepared for. Good and then point. there's a lot I of stress can... also, just the stress with the smell of the smoke anytime someone smells smoke. Um, so there's a, a high stress level. Um, but we also, we, there was a silver lining where we came together to work together and help each other out. But I also agree with the communication and being able to go to a certain reliable source, I think we can do a little bit better with that. And that can help alleviate some of the stress also. Absolutely. I think one of the benefits of what happened last year was it worked. It, it basically managed to prevent Windsor becoming a, a pile of ash. So mm -hmm. um, it can be done. It will take continued looking behind you, but it can be done. I, I but I just... really, what I really got out of this was our leadership. Um, I think that our town management did a wonderful job during the evacuation. They really set the limits, the boundaries, the communication was really good. And they set the precedent where we weren't panicking. Um, they stayed solid and we were not given the option of staying. And it was, this is when you will leave, and this is why you will leave. And that kind of leadership and communication really made people go, you know what, we're good, we're leaving. And we ha had a wonderful town to come back to, and they really made sure to be able to leave the communication solid the entire time. And I really respect them for that. 
Lorraine, this is Cindy with the fire department. And I think that was a really strong comment. I think that one thing, and I, again, I apologize that I don't have the bandwidth to get a photo up, but um, I think one thing that we get very concerned about as we go through these repeated seasons of campaign fires that are threatening us is the, the fatigue that it puts on our community, the evacuation fatigue, the PTSD fatigue, the um, impending doom fatigue, the, it's a red flag fatigue. Um, it, it really starts to take its toll on, on our community. And there are parts of that that people start to go, yeah, I'm, I'm not leaving, I'm done. Look, I've done it the last couple of times, I'm done. Um, and so that is, my, that is a fear of mine because we are so overtaxed by fire since 2017. And so, you know, I, I appreciate Lorraine that you, you know, drew attention to the fact that I feel like we're very blessed in Windsor that we still have that public trust in the decisions that we make. Because I have to tell you, as public leaders, as, as officials in the community, it is a very difficult and courageous decision to evacuate a town of 30,000 people. That does not happen within five minutes. That is not an easy discussion. That is not an easy decision. That takes a lot of collaborative effort and a lot of courageous conversation. And um, because we understand all of the emotion and the heartache and the fatigue that people go through when, when we get to that point. So, I just appreciate that and, and I hope that the Windsor community continues to rely on our expertise and we know that we are empathetic to the fact that we ask a lot of you every fire season now and we will continue to make that plea and that ask upon you when we really believe that it's in your best interest to evacuate or to get ready to evacuate. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, let me have, I think Betsy, you had one last comment, if you don't mind doing that for a nice brief one, and then we'll go on to our next uh, topic. I, I was just going to share during the last wildfire, although my house had no damage, I was in the middle of radiation treatment. And when I came back, my house um, was not inhabitable for me. Um, so I had pre-existing conditions and then conditions when I came home. And so um, there's a lot of layers to oh my gosh, thanks, my house is good, everything is good, to everything really being good. And as the, the fire chief said, they are the experts and they know if we are in the line of danger or not. And so I, I certainly hope that people continue to listen to the, to the, fire, the fire people um, because they can see the much bigger picture than, than each of us individually. And I, I wish to also thank them for their, their courage in taking care of all of us. I think we need to move on. Sheila, I think you had your hand up. Um, we'll have to get you at the next thing and maybe you could add it, your question also into the chat. Uh, so yeah, sorry, Sasha. Yeah, that's great. Thank you everyone for those comments and thanks Cindy for chiming in there. We definitely want to support that over the course of this project and just help the town be even more prepared for those future events. Um, let's change our focus just a little bit or dive a little deeper on the transportation and evacuation piece of the puzzle um, and have Nelson Nygaard jump in and chat about that. And then we'll again have a break for conversation. Um, Sheila, if you don't want to forget your comment, feel free to type it into the chat and we'll get it in the next break as Mindy mentioned. Hi folks, um, my name is Paris Latham. I'm with Nelson Nygaard um, and we're the team that are looking at um, transportation vulnerabilities um, and the town's transportation assets, particularly as they relate to climate change and, um, and these evacuations that we've just touched on. Um, so I think there's two ways to think about transportation in the town. Um, transportation both affects climate um, so, you know, as we drive, we uh, release these GHGs, which is mostly um, in the US comes from vehicles and private vehicles. Um, and in terms of tr changing those types of patterns that uh, partners with um, changes in land use and transportation systems. Um, so next slide, please. There's also the component of how um, climate 
affects transportation. So um, as a lot of you folks just touched on, um, you know, we are required to use these assets when something like an evacuation occurs. Um, so we like to think of this in two ways, the transportation vulnerability. We have these transportation assets. So that would be something like a roadway, um, a transit bus, um, a bridge, something like this. And then most importantly, the people who use the assets. So you folks who are here with us in the meeting tonight. Um, and climate can affect transportation in several ways. Um, there can be damage to facilities. So, you know, I'm sure that's been, been observed in floods um, and fires in the area um, and region. Um, and also we can think about it as a disruption to service. So transit service can be disrupted. Um, folks who rely on that to get to jobs, um, taxis and things like Uber Lyft can be disrupted. Um, and in addition, I want to mention that uh, climate uh, can exacerbate inequities, existing inequities in the system. So um, just something to kind of keep in the back of the mind as we go through these transportation components. Um, examples of trans current transportation vulnerabilities include things like congested roadways, um, damaged or impeded roadways, limited access to vehicles, limited personal ability and lack of non-vehicle transportation options. And so what that really means is that um, if there is an evacuation event, and I'm sure you folks have seen it, um, you can be limited in your movement by the number of folks who are on a, a road network. Um, and we all know folks who may not own a vehicle or may not be able to operate a vehicle, those folks um, can be at risk during these climate events. Um, so just something again to also keep in mind. Next slide, please. So as we look at adaptation and the transportation system, um, we are considering a few things. Um, we are looking at things like the existing bike, bikeway network, how that's connected and how that can be leveraged for additional um, evacuation links uh, in your roadway network. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we are looking at different kinds of responses. So um, these are em existing emergency evacuation maps, which you folks um, just mentioned seem to have those evacuation uh, kind of routes seem to work well for you in the past. And I was glad to hear that. Um, but looking at how those address things like equity, again, how we use these maps and how we use our resources to evacuate folks who may not have access to a vehicle or may not be able to operate. Um, and again, uh, you know, perhaps most importantly is looking at policy change. So looking at how we um, change our trans transportation priorities and policies to kind of plan for this future. And I, I forget who mentioned it, but you know, unfortunately the town might be in a position where they're planning for a wildfire that never comes. But I think, you know, that's at the top of everyone's mind as everyone just shared. Um, and I will pass it on um, to George for the next slide. Hello, everybody. My name is George Haddo. I'm with the Bullock and Haddo, and we are the, you know, disaster preparedness part of the, the program. And I will be very brief and look the answers to the interactive we're going to present. But really, I think the experience that we understand your community has gone through in the past is very encouraging from a evacuation preparedness perspective. And I was heartened by the words that came up in the initial um, question that we asked. Words like an evacuation, what makes an efficient evacuation? Well, one of the big words in that word frame was preparedness, being prepared. And that's what our questions are gonna ask you in a moment. Um, trust, as uh, a couple of people have talked about already, are, is incredibly important in the community trusting the leadership to make a informed decision and that they believe is correct and they will follow. And then that decision being adequately communicated to everybody in a timely manner so that the evacuation can go off, can be executed in a timely manner. So I think what I'm most interested in is seeing, basically Paris's group is going to look at how the, the transportation network and going in and out of town from all the neighborhoods onto the major affairs 
how that might be improved. What we want to look at as disaster preparedness specialists is how prepared are individuals, residents, businesses, group homes, critical facilities, how prepared are they to evacuate so that can facilitate the evacuation as well. So I guess, Mindy, I would kick it over to you and so we can do those last two questions. Excellent, thanks, George. Thanks, Paris, for that oh, sorry, quick sorry. overview. All Thank right, you. everyone's an expert now. So uh, going back, the, the link has been in there, but you still, again, might have it open in your browser. So big question, which of these transportation vulnerabilities pose the greatest challenge for you during a climate emergency? So we're going back to Paris's, you know, what are some of the things that are, are worrying you? Are it congested roadways, damage or impeded, impeded roadways, limited access to a vehicle? limited personal mobility or lack of non-vehicle transportation options. So this is what's happening in a climate emergency. What's gonna cause you guys some problems here? And you can select more than one here, which should be good. Seems like... Yeah. Go ahead, it was interesting. No, I was just going to say it's interesting as people are voting in my breakout group, there was conversations about enhancing walkways and pathways, so non-vehicle options. Um, and then also that some residents are being prepared on their own for these events. There was a neighbor that, you know, if he rolls back his fence during fire season so that people could drive across and access a back road to be able to escape if it was needed. So there are some actions that are already happening organically mm -hmm. to respond to these. Yeah, absolutely. So it does seem like the congested roadway is the number one or something kind of damaged or impeded roadway. So important there. Um, all right, now I'm gonna move us along. And the other one is, this is something you could just write out. So you don't have, you're not being limited by choices. Are there other things, uh, other transportation vulnerabilities you've experienced or expect to experience in the future? Um, so, you know, this could be everything from inability to drive to, um, you know, access and, and many other things. So you can just go ahead and type in your concept here. This might take a few more minutes as people think about this. Again, you can use a couple words if you want to, or uh, hopefully not long, long uh, paragraphs that may not work very yeah, well. You can drop those into the chat. <laughs> exactly. <sure. laughs> Um, Trevor, you have your hand up, dude. Was that your comment in the chat or do you want to add something into this conversation here? Oh, I, I was just uh, uh, adding it in the chat was I was thinking of the different risk factors coming up. Um, I was just wondering if anybody here who'd been through the evacuation had to deal with, say, driving home from work to get to their house to get their important stuff and then leave or going to pick up kids and then back to the house and then leaving or, you know, the the back and forth of mm. evacuation in a town like Windsor just strikes me as a real uh, interesting element or, you know, potential risk factor. So I was just curious. Mm -hmm. um, I had one from Torben who couldn't get into the Mentimeter. So a future inability to drive was one of the issues there. And it looks like we have a couple of not a place to go and not having a place to stay when evacuated. So that's important. Mm -hmm. um, not having that public transportation and, and interesting, someone says, well, we become dependent on smart, which is the smart rail, um, you know, and, and that could be good or bad, presumably, uh, not knowing where to go in the heat of the moment, pun, it looks like it's intended mm -hmm. sufficient time to prepare for evacuation, like the 2017 setting evacuation routes for, for each home. So we don't all take the same place. Um, mm -hmm. Once leaving this area, one may end up in a worse location, right? How do you know which way to go? Do you go south, east, west? Um, how do you go when it's not impacted? Because communications can be down. Um, an aging community for transportation. And then that sufficient time to prepare is on there. And it's also in the chat talking about how Windsor in some ways was lucky in 2019 because they had enough warning in advance of the fires and enough fire equipment in order right. to protect the community, which may not be the case necessarily for the future. Exactly. 
Um, okay, I know it's getting late, so I'm just going to uh, go ahead and move us to the next question, which is also kind of on this evacuation. So this is back to our multiple choice. Um, which of the following have you done to prepare yourself or your family to evacuate in an emergency? So have you planned an evacuation route? Have you registered for an emergency alert service like Nixle? Have you made a reunification plan with family and friends? You know, hey, if you're at work, at school, this is where we're going to meet. Assembled a, a go kit. Uh, have a car you can use to found another option or none of the above. So same idea. Looks like you guys have been thinking about mm -hmm. this. Hey, I'd be curious if people felt their neighbors had done the same thing. You know, maybe you're the select group that's decided to tune in and come to this workshop. And so you've done all these things and no one's none of the above, but I wonder if you feel like your neighborhood is also there. Maybe. That's great. Look at all those dots. It is, it's really good. That's why you're here, you're, you're paying attention, it's great. Um, I think that is all of my, our notes for this one. We have one more set coming up, but uh, I'm going to move us along. Yes, uh, Sasha? Yeah, no, that sounds good. There's talk in the chat about communication, again, being key, and some neighborhoods um, have been working together to prepare. So it's obviously top of mind. Um, so I think their next piece is... Uh, do you want to roll up the next piece, Sasha, on our slides? I think we're sort of at the end of our meeting here in that we did want to end with this idea of revisiting the concept of resilience um, and goals. Um, your views may not have changed. You may have learned something. You may have thought of something new. And so um, you want to go to the next slide, Sasha. Um, so we are going, wanted to do pretty much the same thought that you did earlier today with the uh, uh, resilience question. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead back to, to Mentimeter. I could probably just stay there um, and ask you, so based on what you've heard tonight, do you think, do you still think the same thing about resilience? Wanna go ahead and add in your thoughts here. Is there something more about it that we should be thinking about? Um, we talked about that mental health. We talked about uh, preparation, all sorts of things. Um, so just again, what do you think resilience means kind of at the end of the day? Positive spirit, that's good. Preparedness. No surprises, that would be nice. <laughs> If anything 2020 20 has taught us, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, After all that. With no surprises. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Sasha, this is Cindy, the fire marshal. Hey, Cindy. I think um, a term that may not be popping up here, but is something that's really important for us all to look at is um, an all risk perspective, because as much as we really talk about fire and flood, um, we are a community that is, um, there is no doubt that will be affected um, by, by earthquake, right? So, um, you know, the fire service many, many years ago used to focus very heavily on, um, you know, how to teach people about fire safety. And we have had such a paradigm shift in how we educate the public now. And it's from an all risk perspective. So I think the word all risk needs to be something that we all plant into our, into our conversations and into our mindsets and into our preparedness because we, do, we can identify things like fire and flood, um, but, but earthquakes are not a matter of if, they're just a matter of when. And you know we have other things out there looming in the environment, environmental issues, we have hazardous materials issues. There's, there's all sorts of things out there. So I think I wanna just throw in a word that may not pop up here, but all risk. Great, thank you, Cindy. And you have some people who are agreeing with that on the chat too. So seeing that is a good thing. 
Yeah, and one of those hallmarks of resilience and thinking about like the co-benefits as the town decides on what actions to take, finding ones that are positive in multiple fronts, being more prepared for wildfire can also be more prepared to have your go bag and be ready for an earthquake. Um, so that's great. Thank you for finding that. Absolutely. Um, I have a couple of people who are might, hasn't haven't commented yet, but maybe they say, think it's the same. And, and does anybody want to just sort of raise a comment here? How has anything changed in your thinking? Is is there anything more that we should you know from when you started tonight that you're like uh, I would let, wish I knew more about that, but you know we need to prepare for it. Any other thoughts on there? Um, if you don't mind me saying, I know we're all concerned about fires, but with the rise in temperatures and the droughts, we also probably need to highly consider, you know, water management as a top priority, you know, the, quad the quality of the water, the availability of the water to get to people in need when we do have these emergencies. So I think water management along with planning management needs to also be a priority. That's a really great comment. And you know, especially if we have, you know, there's all sorts of things that could be extreme precipitation that creates water problems because there's infiltration or the opposite where we don't have enough water and we can't fight a flyer because of low reserves. You know, so, and then there's the quality, as you said, to the drinking water. And, and so there's a whole slew of things around we kind of take it for granted that water is everywhere, but there are definitely changes. And I talking to the county of Sonoma, they they definitely feel there's some concerns. So thanks for that. Um, okay, I'm going to change us to the next slide here, which is another version. So you know, we're as I, we mentioned at the very beginning, we want to make sure to base this in the. Um, in the town's values. And so we wanna understand what are the things that are, are most important and how should we begin to start making priorities. And so these are pretty big buckets, obviously, and they all have huge positives and are all part of a really good resiliency strategy. But we're asking you nonetheless, just give us a couple, uh, some, some of the things that you think are most important. Where, if you were to pick two of these things that we should be prioritizing in this conversation, where, where would you put those two votes? You can have three two if you want to. So again, and if anybody has, in, uh, make sure that you have that Mentimeter still on your list. Uh, Yami, if you could just make sure to repost it just in case anybody doesn't have it. I think it's only allowing us one vote. Uh, okay, there you go. And you only get one uh. vote. Thank you. It's okay, well, that... we won't hold you to it. <laughs> it's a hard one. What do you, where do you go with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And ideally the town can do it all, but it may not be all done over the course of the rest of this calendar year in this one project, right? So for building resilience is a process and it takes time and hopefully, you know, this will be one step in that process or in that resilience journey and the town can build on it here and then continue to build on it through the multi-hazard, the multi-jurisdictional hazard plan, water management efforts, continuation, but it looks like Natural environment, community health and well being, equity yeah. transportation. This is Torben. I do not understand what equity means in this context. Sorry. Yeah, well, I think I think that is can be. Uh, it's a, it's a, definitely a term that needs to be uh, defined. So we all know what we're talking about. But I think it means making sure that as we develop our adaptation strategies that equity um, is a driving factor um, and that uh, any plan project or policy that goes into place uh, would be equitable. Um, Sasha, uh, please yeah, add we, to that. I think the idea would be that you would not want to leave anybody behind, that the town okay. can become resilient together and that taking into account some of the issue areas that we talked at the beginning that may make certain segments, neighborhoods, people more at risk to these changes, those should be front and center and address. That could probably be phrased better, sorry. Yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> a lot packed into one, one word. For sure. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I know we're just about the minute, so I'm pushing us here forward to the last slide. You get the last word. Well, we probably will get the last word, but uh, give us your thoughts about what are some of the goals or aspirations that you have for Windsor. Um, you know, so if we were to think out five, ten years from now, you know, what does that look like, and how how do we? What are some of the things we should be planning to do? Again, if this is an open, uh, open air, open ended question. So if you can keep it rather succinct, that's great, but uh, definitely an opportunity for you to give us your thoughts and your own words. And again, the chat is off, also available. Um, this is Cindy, the fire marshal again, sorry. <laughs> that's all right, Cindy, go for it. I think um, I use the term a lot and, and it may resonate with some and it may go over the head of some. Um, I use the term, we need to get back to that Mayberry concept a little bit. And when we talk about COPE, um, citizens organized to prepare for emergencies, it's, in, it's connecting neighbors to neighbors, it's empowering communities, it's giving people their power back because there is so few of us compared to the community that we have to protect. And so, um, you know, I would like to see us get back and I've seen it happen since 2017. I've seen communities that have, you know, been so autonomous and disconnected from their neighbors become this strong um, machine that can support each other and can understand the strengths and weaknesses uh, in their community and come together to kind of form this um, this group that can do their best to self-sustain. And I just, I, I don't have a better way to say it. I think we need to get back to a little bit of Mayberry where we're looking out neighbor after neighbor um, because I don't think the public understands sometimes that there's just a handful of us uh, first responders and rescuers out there for the mass majority. And trust me, it, it, we would love to be able to rescue and save and, and evacuate everybody. But that's a really, that, that's a lofty goal. And that's something that frankly, we're never going to get to. So the more that we empower the community, the more that people take their power back um, and start building these resources within their community, the better we're going to be able to survive and, and thrive and, and recover from what we know is inevitable, whether that be a fire or a flood or an earthquake or a, whatever it may be. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for adding that in, Cindy. We know that resilience depends on all of us and the community won't be resilient without everybody like you being involved and working together to enhance resilience. So thanks for all these great comments and aspirational goals. There are too many to read at the end of our meeting, but we really appreciate that. And it's all gonna be captured and help inform the project moving forward. Great, so Sasha, do you want to wrap us up here? Uh, yes, that would be, I will do that. And then maybe I'll give Carl the very last word. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, but perfect transition, wrap up and next steps. Um, there are ways to continue to be involved. We, I know a lot of you on this workshop you know, call already doing things with your neighborhood, are involved with COPE, are like taking actions or work with organizations in the community that are already involved in these efforts. So please share the word. You can go to the windsorready.com website to get more information on this specific project also Tell your friends and neighbors they can sign up there. Um, we have an open community survey. It's only 10 to 15 minutes. So for those friends and neighbors that weren't able to share their thoughts through the workshop, if you can go to the website, there's a link to the survey there. It'll let them provide their inputs and thoughts on resilience and where this project should go. There's also a place to add your email and your friends could add their emails too to be updated You know, as the project moves along over the course of the year, you'd be added to a listserv for a newsletter. So there would be, you know, not, you know, maybe monthly newsletters, you'd be alerted if another, when the next workshop is available. We'd love to have you continue to participate in the project. Um, there is a question about accessing the presentation and the presentation as well as the recording of the webinar will be posted on the windsorready.com website. 
so that you can view it there or share it with your friends. Um, there is another Engate project, and Carl, I don't know if you want to talk briefly and then take us out about the Redwood Highway corridor and yeah, plan. Very briefly, I would first like to thank all who participated tonight. It is very much participated or very much appreciated. So, on behalf of the town, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank our, our consultant team for putting this together. I think everybody found it uh, quite informative. Um, I would like to put in a very quick plug for, as I said, another workshop uh, coming up on April 8th, starting at 6 p.m., the old Redwood Highway Corridor Enhancement Project. Uh, if you have an interest in voicing your opinion or concerns on how old Redwood Highway should look and be developed uh, as time goes on, all the way from Shiloh Road on the south to Star Road at the north, uh, please chime in to that workshop on April 8th. Uh, they would love to hear from you. So with that, Sasha, I think uh, that pretty much wraps it up. It sure does. Thank you, Carl. And thank you again, everyone, for taking time out of your evening to join us and share your thoughts. We appreciate it. The town appreciates it. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.